Fort George across the water in Canada, so we've invaded. All four of us. <laughs> we made it, we're in, so that worked, you know. <laughs> so, um, uh, we're going to talk a bit about this thing right here, which is a flintlock smoothbore musket. We're going to get to loading and firing of this in just a minute. Uh, the American version, the British version, pretty much the same. They all work the same way. Uh, they look a little bit different. Some of the fixtures up top are a little different for decorative purposes, but the mechanism all works the same way. And I'll explain that right now. Basically, it's very simple. When you pull this trigger, this piece of flintstone here will fly forward, strike this piece of metal, and make a spark. The spark then lands right here in this little dish on the side called the pan, and to set off some gunpowder, you pour it in there. When it sets off the gunpowder here, it travels through a small hole along the barrel, sets off the gunpowder on the inside, and a musket ball comes flying out the end. So basically, it's flint, hit metal, make spark, go boom. That's pretty much it. And uh, because of that, there were a few problems. There were three big problems with this weapon. And that determined the way the men fought and the way they dressed. So people have to look at us and go, are you out of your mind? <laughs> You're wearing a bright red coat with white pants, a big tall shiny hat, and a convenient shoot me here, Maximilian your chest. And to make matters worse, you then get in a big straight line and walk at the enemy. That's the thought. Why don't you put some green and black out of hide behind a tree? Well, they weren't crazy, they weren't stupid, it's all because of this thing right here. Now the first problem with this weapon is, it is very unreliable. It doesn't like to work all the time, especially in bad weather. On a nice day, when the weather is just right, these things still have about a 1 in 5 misfire rate. <laughs> that means 1 time to 5 when you pull the trigger, you get a glorious click, <laughs> but no bang. If it's raining, if it's windy, if you just walk through a creek, if it's snowing, if it's humid, if the musket woke up in a weird mood, it tends not to work. So very, very unreliable. The second big problem is that this is also very inaccurate. This is not a rifle. It is a smoothbore musket. The difference is that, now they had rifles back then. The difference is that rifles have rifling, which are metal grooves on the inside of the barrel that make the ball spin as it comes out, causing it to go very far in a nice straight line. This is like a piece of pipe. It's as smooth on the inside as it is on the outside. And the ball, you fired out of it, was a little smaller, so you could load it a lot faster. So, when you pull the trigger, the ball would sometimes rattle a bit down the end of the barrel. Whichever way it rattled last oh. is which way it's gonna go. <laughs> so at about 100 yards, about the length of one football field, uh, you could hit what you're aiming at, but past that, who knows where it's going. If you were 200 yards away, sir, I could aim for you, I could hit you. <laughs> or you, or the ground, or go over your head. I have no idea where this thing is going. So that is why they fought in those big, long lines. Because if you're by yourself, hiding behind a tree, you could shoot at somebody all day and not actually hit them once. <laughs> Those wavy and smile, you know, how you doing? Good to see ya, it's coming out. And if your musk is not working, you're in serious trouble, because you're by yourself. So you get a thousand of your best friends, you get in one big straight line, everybody loads and fires at the exact same time. If your musket didn't work, no big deal, the other 900 probably did. And instead of one musket ball doing this, coming across the field and veering to the left or to the right or up or down, you now have a thousand musket balls doing this. Literally a wall of lead is flying at the enemy. Somebody is going to hit something. <laughs> so, everybody fought that way. The British did, the Americans, the French, the Prussians. Everybody fought in some form of that line pattern because given the weaponry at the time and how they worked, it was the best way to fight. Now, the last problem with this weapon is that it generates an awful lot of smoke. I mean an awful <laughs> lot of smoke. And you'd think with these bright colors on, you'd see me coming a mile away. In reality, most American and British soldiers during the War of 1812 stated the first time they could actually see the enemy is this 
business. You folks are busy in that wooden structure behind me right now. That's it. I'll give you an idea of how bad it could get. At the Battle of Lundy's Lane, at one point they were from me to about you away, sir, this close, and they couldn't see each other at that distance. So if a guy walks out of the smoke this close to you, how long do you have to decide, good guy, bad guy? Shoot, don't shoot. Are you ready? Go. <laughs> You've got about half a second. So you wanted a bright, distinctive uniform that said right away, I am on your team, don't shoot. <laughs> so everybody had a team color. <clears throat> British wore this. The Americans, very similar. They wore white pants, white belts, big tall shiny hat, but instead of a bright red coat, they wore a bright blue coat. Red team, blue team. <laughs> very simple. You knew exactly who was on what side. Now they did have camouflage 200 years ago. For example, there was a regiment raised right across the water there in Upper Canada called the Glengarry Light Infantry. And they wore dark green coats with black cuffs and collars, black belts, dark gray pants, solid black shakos. Look at any tree line over there, you see lots of dark green, black and gray. Right. It's great. One problem, when you got an open battlefield, if the British wear red, Americans wear blue, who shoots at the guys in green? <laughs> Everybody shoots at the guys in green. <laughs> and I'm sad to say at the Battle of Lundy's Lane, in 1814, the Glengarries were skirmishing with the Americans. They were falling back to the British line. The British saw dark silhouettes coming up into the smoke. Looked at it and went, is it, is it blue? Is it, well, it's not red. Bang! And opened fire. And I'm sad to say more Glengarries were killed that day by their own men. They didn't know who they were. Call it thick smoke. So, today, we call this friendly fire. 200 years ago, we called it Friendly fire. <laughs> and how much has changed in over 200 years? So right now, it's going to go through a couple loading procedures. Oh, we ask you to kind of stay on this side. They're going to go over here and kind of fire that way. So you ask you, well, you're good there. You're fine. Uh, but you're the mark. <laughs> so make sure no one moves beyond you, sir. That's okay. So the first load we're going to do is called the, the platoon loading exercise. This is going through it step by step. Our British soldiers train on this every day, all day in some cases. And they do this for training purposes to make sure they knew exactly what they were doing. And even before a battle started, kind of calm everybody down and make sure they were focused on what they were doing. Put my cartridge. Boom! Okay. Title, cartridge! On the First step reach back, pull out one pre made cartridge, you bite off the end, and spit it at the enemy. <laughs> Very menacingly, am I at. Oh. Hey! 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 You then poured a small bit of gunpowder into the side here, poured everything else down the barrel. Powder, paper, ball, all went down the front of the weapon. Nothing got slotted in the back like a modern firearm. Withdraw, rounds the ram! You then pull your ram rod and make sure everything's ran right to the bottom of the barrel. Right, and it was very important to make sure you pull this thing out before you fired it. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong, it'll make an you know, excellent projectile, it'll fly across the battlefield shish kebab, two or three enemy soldiers, no problem. The problem was, can't you, can't you can't reload, you just can't call time out, you know, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, you can't do that. So, you give it a tap, it's actually part of the drill, you tap it to make sure it was still there. Show down, it's on. And after all that, ready for one shot. <laughs> a machine gun, it's not. But the British were very well trained. The average British soldier was expected to get off at least four rounds a minute. That was the standard in the British Army. Fifteen seconds was the standard. The fastest I've ever read or seen myself, because I've seen it done, is ten seconds. That's the fastest I've ever read about or seen, which is six shots a minute, believe it or not. So I'm going to warn you now, folks. Uh, these are guns, if they work. <laughs> they make a bit of a bang if you don't like, like loud noises, especially on the end here. You may want to plug your ears. Make hey! Two, hey! Set! Fire! Primal load! Now on primal load, they go as fast 
as humanly possible. Like I said, a good British soldier was expected for four rounds a minute. That was the standard. Just keep going and going as fast as humanly possible. <coughs> Talk to you. Have a wonderful day here at Fort Niagara. Woo!